Um, I have a wonderful ministry. I, I think I have the best job in the world. I get to train preachers to help uh, people like you, help uh, mainly pastors, but not just pastors, men and women, to be better preachers. And by better, I just mean able to handle God's word more faithfully, uh, better in communicating God's word to his people. It's a wonderful job. Uh, I run workshops on preaching, and as Alan said, when I say preaching, I mean expository preaching. I just believe that's the way to preach the Bible, to open up, expose God's word, all of God's word. It's all God-breathed from Genesis to Revelation. Expose God's word, explain it, apply it, that God's people hear God speak and respond in faith and obedience. I run workshops. I, I just do in my workshops what you'd read in any standard textbook on preaching. How you find the main idea of a passage, uh, how you structure the passage, how you prepare a sermon, introductions like the one I'm doing now, applications, and illustrations. Uh, I, I believe in stories. We all do. We are shaped by the stories we've heard. No matter what country you belong to, what culture has formed you, what language you speak, the stories you hear have shaped you. Shaped your thoughts, your feelings, your attitudes. I will rem well remember years ago, a young Chinese couple came from China to study in Sydney. They were atheists. They came to Sydney, they heard the gospel, and were converted. I asked the young man, what has changed since you became a Christian? He said in a flash, I used to hate Japanese people. It would not surprise me if he had never met a Japanese person. He was born 30 years after World War II ended, but he had heard the stories of what the Japanese army did in China. Six million Chinese killed. Tens of thousands of Chinese women and young girls raped repeatedly. He'd heard the stories from his family, his school, his country, and those stories had shaped his thoughts, his feeling, his prejudice, and had birthed hatred. But then he said, but now I love them. What had turned hatred to love? He had heard another story, the true story of God's love for his enemies, how God loved those who hated him and gave the gift of his son that they could be forgiven. And this story had reshaped his thoughts, his attitude, his behavior, his feelings. That's the power of the story. Good stories educate, inform, challenge, and touch us deeply and emotionally. Well, this morning, we're hearing a story, a true story, a true historical narrative. It is quite simply the story of the, the Lord meeting the men on the road to Emmaus, one of the most wonderful stories, not just in Luke, but the whole Bible. I mean, this story has everything. It's, it's great drama. It has deep sorrow and heartbreak, the suspense, drama, uh, uh, um, tension, a wonderful revelation, a dramatic climax. 
But the story, too, is full, full of theological richness. We have in this story, implicitly, how we're saved. We have announced the resurrection. We have here a basic lesson in hermeneutics, how you understand, read, and preach the Bible. We have God's sovereignty, God's hiding and revealing. We have Luke wonderfully intertwining two of his great metaphors, the metaphor of the way, the road, the journey, and the metaphor of meals with Jesus. And we have, too, a picture of the right response to meeting Jesus. And it is for Luke a very important story. If the amount of space a writer gives to an account is some indication of its importance, this is important to Luke. We have in our English Bibles 53 verses. 22 are given of this story on the road to Emmaus. That's 40% of Luke's resurrection narratives. It is for Luke, and therefore for us, an important story. A story in five scenes. So let's this morning walk down the road metaphorically to Emmaus. Scene 1, verses 13 to 16. Verse 13, that very day. So it's still what we call Easter Sunday. We heard yesterday from Bishop Tito uh, the context. Uh, the women have gone heartbroken to the tomb. They've heard the angel's word, he has risen, returned to the disciples, not just the eleven, maybe a hundred or more in, the, in, in, in this big house, told them the good news, and with the exception of Peter, they've scorned them, dismissed their words as nonsense, which is surprising, isn't it? The unanimous word of angels, of, of women, an angel's word, and just dismissed as an idle tale. I think we see in a moment why. So I guess it's around mid-afternoon. We meet two of these disciples. Surprisingly, not two of the eleven. Two we have never met before, and until we get to glory, we'll never meet again in the Bible. All we know of them is they belong to a town, a village called Emmaus about seven miles from where we are. So if we knew where Emmaus was, and we don't, we could have gone there on Tuesday on our tour. We could have taken the Emmaus walk. We'd get back a bit late, but it'd be very edifying, about a seven-hour round trip. One's called Cleopas. We don't know the other name. Some have suggested it was Mrs. Cleopas. Uh, based really on John's account of the cross, and there around the cross were Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the wife of Clopas. And Clopas and Cleopas could be variations of the same name. But I'm not persuaded. Given Luke's tendency to give the women names, Anna, Mary, Martha, Rhoda, Lydia, given his tendency to give the couple's names, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Ananias and Sapphira, Priscilla and Aquila. So I'm not persuaded. We just don't know the name, and frankly, it doesn't really matter. And they're discussing, of course, what they're all talking about, verse 14, the tumultuous events of the last couple of days, and then they realize, to their surprise, they're not alone. A man just seems to appear. I can imagine the conversation. Oh, sir, you, you must walk very quietly. <laughs> we hardly heard you. Are you a pilgrim also on your way home from Passover? 
They spend maybe one, two, three hours talking with him. They hear his voice. They see his face. They smell him. They bump into him. A man they've known for maybe six months, a year, two years, they know him well. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Not in the fading light, his face was in darkness. Not overcome by grief, they couldn't see him. No, they were kept by God from recognizing him. Because God will determine the time, the place, and the event by which they see him and believe him. Scene two, the conversation, verses 17 to 24. The man asked them an innocent question. Verse 17, what is this conversation you are holding with each other? And they just stop. They're stunned. <laughs> what conversation? What we're all talking about. How could... How could you be in Jerusalem and not know? Imagine it's September the 13th, 2001. You're in New York, in Manhattan, walking down Park Avenue. And a man comes to you and says, why is everyone around here so glum and so sad and depressed? <laughs> Haven't you heard? What? Have you been in New York? Yes, I've been in Manhattan. Haven't you heard? The two towers? The planes? 3,000 dead? Please tell me. Well, that's how they feel. They're stunned you could be in Jerusalem and not know because for them the death of Christ was as catastrophic as 9-11. Except, of course... The man did know. So they tell him three things about Jesus of Nazareth. This is 90 to 24. First of all, a man, a prophet, powerful in word, a man clearly empowered, anointed by God. Clearly. He had to be the Messiah. He had to be the Messiah, the world saviour. But secondly... They crucified him. How do you crucify the Messiah? How does a man, powerful in word and deed, become weak in betrayal and death? How does a man, so clearly empowered by God, anointed by God, become abandoned by God and die under God's curse? And we had hoped... He was the one to redeem Israel. And in the space of a few hours, our hopes, our dreams, our joy have been shattered. And third, just to add to our sorrow, the women have sown a seed of confusion, telling us he's alive. But, but they saw him die. They saw him buried, and besides, messiahs don't die and rise again. Can't you see the irony in their words? And they crucified him, but we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. What a difference a word makes. Don't you understand, men? And they crucified him, and that was how he would be the one to redeem Israel. In a sense, they're so close, but they can't make the connection because they never understood their Bibles. Scene three, 
the explanation. Now Jesus speaks. He says, friends, it's not me who's ignorant, not me who doesn't understand. Verse 25, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, not believe my teaching, not believe my prophecies, my, my predictions. Here's your greater guilt. You never understood the scriptures. Then he takes them on the most exhilarating Bible overview ever heard. And from the Bible, he answers the central question, verse 26. Was it not necessary, did not God ordain, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? It was all there in the scriptures, but you never listened. Now let me say, before we stand too quickly in judgment on these men, can I say that the church of Jesus Christ, and I mean the Bible-believing church of Jesus Christ, stand even more culpable. Not only is the preaching of the Old Testament given scant attention in our churches, it's rarely preached. When it is, there's no gospel. There's no Jesus. Friends, I travel a lot around the world teaching preaching. I hear our sermons in many places. The sermons I hear are heartbreaking. I don't mean broken in contrition. I mean they're woeful. Here's the comment of a principal from a Bible college about the preaching in his area. Here, our preaching is very weak. What comes out of preachers' mouths is often just noise. They use one verse and then they jump to anything. Can I say, beloved, Satan loves noise. He hates music, he hates truth, he hates the gospel, but he loves noise. The principle goes on. There is very little Bible in what's being preached, and it is not exegetical. Another Bible school principal in another country said to me about the preaching in his city, and these are Anglican churches, he said this, and I've never forgotten it. There is not a church in this city, well, I don't know a church in this city, where the Bible is taught and people love one another. I've not heard a more damning indictment on the church. No Bible, no love. And there's no love because there's no Bible. I love our rallying cry. I really do. We will preach Christ faithfully to the nations. But I have another rallying cry. We will preach Christ faithfully to our churches. So Jesus tells us here how to preach and teach. Beginning, verse 27, beginning with Moses and the prophets. I'm staying at the Ramada Hotel. If you walk up the driveway to the front entrance, on your right is a sculpture of Abraham offering Isaac from Genesis 22. I heard a sermon years ago on that passage, great passage, Main point of application, only point of application, have the faith of Abraham. Very important. But the only point? The only point? Take your son, your only son, 
whom you love. Take your beloved son. Climb the mountain with the wood for the sacrifice carried on his back. He said to the servants, stay here, we'll come back to you. Hebrews says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he received him back from the dead. It's all there, the gospel, isn't it? Substitution of the atonement, resurrection, all there. In all the scriptures, he would have taught them how to read the law of Moses. How he was the word through whom God made all things. He had crushed Satan's head. He was the fulfillment of the Passover, the Exodus, the whole sacrificial system. He's the end of the law. He had taught them how to read the history. The true Joshua, the Lord saves. The true Samson, who by his death won a greater victory than his life. The true and greater David. David who killed the enemy of God's people, Goliath, with a sling. But the greater David kills our greater enemies. Death, Satan, sin with his life. He taught them how to read the Psalms and the wisdom. I'm writing a book of the Psalms. It's all gospel. We read on Tuesday, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's called the fifth gospel. Psalm 16, which Peter quotes at Pentecost. I will not abandon my Holy One to the grave. He taught them how to read the prophets. Of course, Isaiah 53, like a lamb led to the slaughter, wounded for our transgressions. How to read Jonah. Three days in the belly of Sheol and vomited to life. How to read Zechariah, chapter 12. They will look at me, the Lord, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David to cleanse him from sin and impurity. And not just a verse here or there, the whole sweep of Scripture is the gospel story, the story of salvation, from promise to fulfillment, from the shadow of the cross to the shadow of the resurrection to reality, from the hope of a coming Messiah to his arrival, death, and resurrection, all of Scripture. Is it any wonder, with almost his dying breath, Paul writes to Timothy, how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If for a year or two or three you only preach the Old Testament, your people could be saved. They'd hear it all. Creation, sin, wrath, judgment, grace, forgiveness, atonement, resurrection, justification, sanctification. It's, it's all there. It's all there. They, they would be trained in righteousness and equipped for every good work. Except I fear in most churches they wouldn't be saved. Because if they hear the Old Testament, they never hear Jesus. Beloved, this is the need of the hour. I go to one place regularly and there a retired bishop's wife says to me, Oh, Michael, there is such a hunger for the word of God here. In some parts, people aren't just hungry. 
they are dying of starvation. For want of the word of God. For want of preaching that shows Jesus crucified, buried, risen, glorified, coming again. We have such a privilege to be shepherds of God's flock. Grant that our pastures, our dioceses, our rich green fields, and our sheep are well fed and can withstand the onslaughts of the devil, false teaching, immorality, greed, that on the last day, they can be our joy and crown, they can be pure and spotless and blameless before the throne of God above. Scene four, the revelation. Verse 28, 29, 28. So they drew near to the village. He acted as if he were going further. What will happen now? The versions imply our Lord played a bit of a game with them. He pretended to go on. In fact, he planned to stay, but he just played this game of pretense. There's no pretense here. There's no pretense. He would have gone on had they not urged him strongly to stay. If they hadn't invited him in, he would have kept on walking. God hid Jesus from them. In his time, God will reveal Jesus to them. God is sovereign. But we are responsible. They had to invite him in. And remarkably, the guest becomes the host. And we are told, in the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened. As he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Now, it's not that he had some kind of quirky way of breaking bread. And they recognized him. Or the form of words was particularly unique to Jesus. It's quite prosaic, isn't it? He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it. That's very ordinary. A friend of mine said a while ago, maybe as he broke the bread, he showed the holes in their hands. And they recognized him. No. They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Not surprisingly... In the opening of the scriptures, I think they understood as he taught. Their hearts burned. They understood he, Jesus was the Messiah. They began to understand. They began to understand the women are right, he's risen. It's like they've been in a dark room all their life and the lights are switched on and it's blazing light. They begin to understand. But it is in that special meal their eyes are opened. The last time we heard these form of words was just, of course, at the Last Supper. The breaking of bread became, as you know, in the early church, a key component of their life together. Acts 2. They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship prayers, the breaking of bread. And there, as God's people gather in a house, in a home, in love and acceptance, they break bread. They remember, they proclaim the Lord's death. And in that moment, they see Jesus. And those wonderful words, verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us? while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. You see, a burning heart isn't something a preacher can manipulate or engineer or manufacture. It's a work of the Spirit. And the Spirit's work, as you know, is to testify to Jesus. And we see here word 
and spirit working together. The scriptures are opened. Jesus is revealed and the spirit sets hearts on fire. Scene five, the return. They hastened back to Jerusalem. They told what had happened on the road. I, I hear many sermons in my country, Australia. I think it's fair to say uh, the most common application of most sermons is this. You must tell your friends about Jesus. I hear it again and again and again in sermons, you must tell about Jesus. But the fact we say it again and again and again suggests what? It's not happening. They're not telling. It strikes me, and maybe you too in the Gospels, people don't have to be told. In fact, they're often told not to tell. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. The woman of Samaria, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. We can't but speak of what we've seen and heard. Isaiah says that beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Do you know what makes beautiful feet run? Burning hearts. But when the fire has died down and the embers are cold and the wonder of the cross and the glory of the resurrection has faded, hearts stop burning and feet stop running. And we have to command and beg and beseech and urge people to tell. I want to end with two words of application. I think Luke has two purposes in this passage. First, remind us again to, give, to make us sure Christ has risen. He's alive. This is one of his many convincing proofs that we can know. God has made him both Lord and Christ whom they crucified. God has vindicated him. He's conquered death and therefore, of course, we will rise with him. We can be sure. We can be sure. I'm flying home like you, many of you, on Saturday. I have my ticket. You know the best word on the ticket? Confirmed. Confirmed. But I've learned over the years on Qatar Airways and Qantas and Kenya Airways not to get my hopes up too high. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Your flight has been cancelled. But um, it said confirmed. Well, that doesn't mean actually confirmed. <laughs> One day, we will all take a flight one way to the presence of our God, our creator, our maker, our judge, our redeemer. And beloved, your seat is confirmed. Because he died and rose again, we can be sure today you'll be with me in paradise. And secondly, we are told this, that we can preach Christ faithfully from the scriptures. I, I did my studies at Moore College in Sydney. 
In my fourth year, I was a student minister in a church. I preached one night on Ecclesiastes. Can I say humbly, it was a good sermon. The pastor agreed. He said, Michael, that was a good sermon. I thought, I know. <laughs> but he made one qualifying remark I've never forgotten. He said to me, it would have gone down well in a synagogue. Can I say, as you go today to get your photo taken, if perchance you meet the head of a synagogue in the city, he says, oh, Bishop, please can you come tomorrow on Shabbat to our synagogue and preach? So yes, I'd be happy to. And as you preach, like here, they applaud your sermon. They call out, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And the synagogue leader says to you, oh, Bishop, that was wonderful. Come back next Shabbat and preach again. If that happens, can I say to you in your sermon, something is missing. Someone is missing. The Lord Jesus and his gospel. We will proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations and the churches. And as we show Jesus in all of Scripture, by his grace, God may set hearts on fire. And if God should set hearts on fire with love for Jesus, in our parishes, our dioceses, then our church will indeed be a light to the world. Let us proclaim Christ faithfully to our churches for the glory of God. Amen.